it's very hard not sorry this is so much to talk about it's hard to even know where to start we're currently two months into witnessing the biggest escalation in tensions between Israel and Palestine seen in generations. The rubble the little girl was pulled from has become a familiar scene in Gaza. An airstrike, collapsed buildings, chaos. The daily reality of watching these scenes unfold can be overwhelming. On this special one-off episode of Radio Juxtapose, we speak to a small group of artists and academics who've agreed to share their experiences of how this conflict has impacted them and their perspectives on it. They offer advice on how we can better understand it and ask the question, what role does art play in times like this? Welcome back to Radio Juxtapose. My name is Doug Gillen, and today we call on three different speakers with different perspectives and experiences to deep dive into one of the most sensitive conflicts in the modern world, as we try to unpick the tangled web that surrounds Israel and Palestine. After two months of war, a death toll that currently sits in the tens of thousands, the scale of destruction for an area relatively seasoned in conflict is currently unprecedented. Every single one of us listening to this episode will be coming in with pre-established beliefs and understandings of protagonists and antagonists, victims and perpetrators, right and wrong. And we have absolutely no sense of delusion in being able to fix whatever is going on out there. But we did want to offer a space for those within this little part of the art world to be heard. We don't necessarily dive headfirst into politics like this at Radio Juxtapose too often, and it is worth mentioning that this is somewhat of a sharp U-turn from our usual format, but it felt like an important part of history that we needed to engage with. Today we're going to hear from Israeli-American artist Adam Yakutieli, also known as No Hope, London-based author and lecturer Raphael Schachter, and Palestinian-American artist Saj Issa. We have tried tirelessly to find a Palestinian voice on the ground in the region, but after almost a month of near misses and almost, it just proved too hard to find someone willing to speak. Some because of the inclusion of Israelis on the podcast and others purely just for fears of their own safety. More than anything, this episode is an attempt to bring together people with varying degrees of connection to this and try to create a rounded insight into this situation. What will already be familiar for many of us is the incredible sensitivity in the language that we use that surrounds this topic. I'd say more so than any other region of conflict in the world. Every effort has been made to approach this episode with the care and sensitivity that feels essential and every effort has been made to ensure that any information beyond personal experience has been fact-checked and verified to the absolute best of our ability. I'd like to start by simply asking Israel-based artist Adam Yakutieli to describe the moments watching Hamas attacks unfold on the 7th of October. It goes without saying that this episode does contain some graphic depictions of war and some pretty heavy, sensitive material. So please take that into consideration before listening. Adam, thank you for joining us for this how are you at the moment? I guess that's as good a place to start as any. I'm doing all right. I'm doing all right. You know, the days fluctuate a lot and it depends on the time time of the day. The air is very, very thick. You're in Tel Aviv. How would you describe the mood there at the moment? I think it also fluctuates. I think that over the past month and a half, it's gone through a lot of like different stages. I'd say that like, uh, you know, they're like the different stages of grief and I'm not sure where where we are in that i think there's a lot of a lot of things that are coming out of that grief yeah i think in the past like week or so things started to open up a bit after you know they, they were like closed for the whole time and people were kind of like in this very uh heavy state of yeah just kind of like completely out of it really disoriented trying to make sense and process i don't think there was much time for people to process um, because things kind of un continue to unfold. I think in the first week, people were very active uh, in terms of like volunteering and sourcing and distributing food and equipment to the evacuees and the survivors. And, and it was all civilian because uh, the government wasn't, uh, wasn't doing anything and it wasn't playing what well, they weren't really present uh, and still aren't. So I think that that there was kind of like this adrenaline from the 
in the first like week, week and a half. And once that started wearing off and people kind of like sunk into this uh, darker place. Are you able to tell us what it was like from your personal experience in witnessing this new wave unfold? I woke up on Saturday around 6.30 from uh, Sirens. Sirens, they're, they're not, it's not like it happens every day, but it, have, it happens every once in a while. The Sirens mean that their are rockets being fired over from Gaza and didn't think anything of it. And I got up and, you know, walked into the, like the, the stairwell and, and then the safe room. You know, I think that usually it's, it's really easy to contextualize these things because, uh, you know, everything is always at a boiling point here and it's kind of like a pressure cooker and there's a lot of provocation, especially with the right wing government that we have now. And when I got back into bed after like the siren ended, then I opened my phone and started understanding what was happening. The news stations and like websites and, and stuff like that, they weren't really reporting on what was happening. And I had found through bits and pieces of stuff, you know, accounts that I follow on, on social media and telegram channels, uh, seeing in, in real time, what was, what was unfolding. And I think there were, there were many people that were discovering any, you know, gathering bits of information through those means and just witnessing the most horrific, brutal, uh, footage. And it was hard to, it was hard to imagine that it was that that's what was happening because I think that in this kind of like power dynamic that we're in, then Israel is never really at a, a truly vulnerable state. And that's why when I started seeing the videos, I'm like, this can't, like, I, I couldn't fathom it. More harrowing stories of how people were killed in the Hamas attacks are still emerging. One teenager who had just celebrated her 18th birthday died after being shot while sheltering in the safe room of her home in Nahal Oz, which is close to the Gaza border. Her father was taken hostage. The more that I saw uh, and the more that started to like kind of be discovered through like personal like WhatsApp messages and text messages, I think we all realized how how real it was and how how big of a scale. It was, it was really, really hard to grasp that that's what was actually happening. And I think that the, the, the mainstream news stations weren't reporting on it because they were, didn't want to get everyone in a panic. And I think there was this, you know, this kind of like, which I think was, it was, it was a very, very strange place to be in. I think it's still unfolding, like understanding the victims, you know, bodies are still being identified. People that were thought to have been missing are now discovered that they were, that they were uh, killed. It was a really big shock, and I think that there was no time to really process it because everything was moving so fast. Once I understood what was actually happening, then I knew that the retaliation is going to be like something that we haven't witnessed before. Since October 7th, the Israeli military says it has hit Gaza with more than 22,000 strikes. That by far surpasses anything we've seen in modern warfare in terms of intensity and ferocity. And we really, honestly, are just getting a glimpse of it here. How would you describe where your political ideology might lie? I do like recognize the fact that it's all been very like confusing because it's all very layered and it touches on all these different layers and aspects, I guess, of my identity as someone that sees himself uh, on the, the left-turn side of the political map, as someone that recognizes and speaks out against the occupation, but also as a Jewish person, you know, these things do kind of, you know, they do touch on all this generational trauma. I think that's kind of like an unexpected reaction that uh, that I didn't think of uh, initially, but as time goes on, then I do realize that it does it does have a have a place. Again, I don't know where to place it in in kind of like the the stages of grief, but I think that's you know why why people are reacting as if it's you know feel that it's a a, a war for survival. It's kind of something that needs to they feel that the need for like revenge and to seek uh, like retribution. I, I really don't agree with that. I think that that revenge 
will not get us anywhere. What's happening in Gaza is is not going to achieve the answer that many people are looking for. And of course, the the cost of, of human life and the dehumanization and the kind of abstraction of what is seen as kind of like collateral damage is, it's for me, it's really hard to grasp. And I think that, you know, the rhetoric has become so violent. And I know that it comes from a, a, a deep, deep place of pain and of, uh, you know, people are mourning and people... Uh, think and act and say things when they're uh, grieving, but uh, but I think that it's it's kind of created this veil almost about what's what's happening in Gaza. It's not going to fix the trauma that we went through, and it's not going to bring our dead back, and it's not going to uh, it's not going to rectify the situation. And I think that also, you know, Israel it, it's really such a small place that by by some degree of separation, everyone was directly affected by it. You know, like I have so many friends that have family members that are missing, that are kidnapped, uh, that were murdered, yeah. like entire families that have been really destroyed. And every, it's so small that every, you can't really separate. It's not like an abstract thing that happened. Uh, you know, even though Tel Aviv was kind of like really feels like encompassing, but it's kind of like uh, kind of like closing in. But I know that it's not the answer, you know. You asked about like society and the larger kind of climate. There's not a lot of space for any empathy with with the people in Gaza. There's not a lot of space for holding multiple pains and multiple truths at once. I think it's a it's a very complex place to be in, and it's a very in a way it's a very like lonely space or demographic to be in. Do you feel that your voice or your position here? Is that reflective of the larger mood of Israel? Um, I don't think so. I don't think so. I, th- I think that the, the, the people that, that oppose this, you know, the, the bombing of Gaza and oppose the war and are calling for ceasefire, I think that they're, the way that I feel it is, is that it's, it's a very big minority. In reality, it probably is, is still a minority, even though, you know, I'm, I'm aware that I'm in some sort of like, uh, we're, we're all in echo chambers in the end of the day. But I think that, uh, in terms of kind of like mainstream Israeli society, many people, uh, there's, there's kind of like, uh, there are different degrees, I think, of people's positions. Israel for the past year has had its most extreme right wing, uh, fundamentalist, uh, settler based, uh, and driven. Uh, government for the past like 10 months or so since it kind of since the government started acting or b- had been put in position and there have been mass demonstrations against this uh, a judicial rehaul that is basically an attempt at, and in, that is successful so far in dismantling the the judicial uh, system and justice system essentially making it like anti-democratic of course, like before, you know, there, and, and within those like mass mass protests, there have been a group of uh, like a very small group that are have been saying that it hasn't been a, do- a democracy before. Uh, as long as there's occupation, there can't be uh, the democracy never truly existed. I think also from like my position, like Israeli society, they, they aren't they're living in like an entirely different reality. They're not aware, like the media here is still focused on either October 7th or uh, like the the Israeli sausages or like all the Israeli soldiers that are dying. People here have no grasp of what's happening in Gaza. And it's like, you know, which as, as is, Gaza is kind of like an out of sight, out of line situation generally. Um, and now, there's such a big disconnect. Hundreds of Palestinians protested the closing of a space in front of the Damascus Gate while Jewish extremists march elsewhere shouting death to Arabs. What was it like watching the world react after your country was going through the biggest hit of trauma that it's experienced in you know our generation's lifetime? I think that I, will, I was and still am kind of frustrated by the lack of uh, nuance. I think that people 
are used to, especially online, they're used to speaking about things in like very binary terms. I think that people are used to seeing a specific dynamic uh, between the Israeli state and Gaza. And I think for the first time ever, that power dynamic, at least in the first 24 hours, was changed forever. And there was this kind of like uh, illusion that was shattered. But the response was so swift and so brutal. I think that it overshadowed uh, what people well, here experience on the 7th of October. Uh, and it's kind of snowballing. It's bringing all these other all these other issues into it. And I think that we're in a state of emergency and we need to figure out how we stop everything. I feel that both both sides feel that their tragedy is being overlooked. When in reality, two people are experiencing immense tragedy at the moment and continues to derail even more, both in terms of uh, what is happening uh, from a military standing point and the, you know, the bombings and uh, bombardments in Gaza, but also in terms of the discourse, it's bringing us all into kind of a more impossible, impossible situation. You know, I think all of this is being done under the guise of of uh, creating security for Israelis and security for the Israeli state. When in reality, I think that all the, the, the what's happening in Gaza is progressively making it less and less safe. There is no real deep orientation or thought about the future. The ripple effects of what's happening are tragic. I know that a lot of it also plays into ensuring that though there will be this ongoing war at least to a certain extent or conflict because that's also historically that's what's kept Netanyahu in power because it, it diverts a lot of attention and a lot of heat to his personal crimes does he survive this i hope he doesn't i hope he doesn't i want to make it clear that I, I hope his political period doesn't survive i don't I'm not say i'm not implying anything we'll rejoin with adam later on in the podcast I've generally tried to avoid talking about specific numbers for this episode as everything's changing so quickly, but for context, at the time of recording right now, it's reported that roughly 1,400 Israelis were killed on the 7th of October, with over 200 hostages taken. As part of the military retaliation, the death toll of Palestinians in Gaza will hit 20,000 by the time this episode makes air. Of that number, almost half are children and roughly a hundred journalists have been killed while trying to bring the reality of this destruction to the rest of the world. For many of us, the images of death, particularly of young children, continue to flood our social media timelines, and it seems like the end is still a long way out of sight. Do you know anything about that? What can you report at this stage? Ah! All right. Yumna, please take cover. If you are in a position to do so safely, you can explain to us what we're happening. If you are not in a position to do so safely, then please get to safety. No, it's okay. Um, This is a missile attack on on Palestine Tower, right in the middle of Gaza City. In response to the bombardment of Gaza, the UN Security Council held an emergency meeting which put forward a resolution for a ceasefire. Among the 15 members, the US was the sole veto. 13 members moved in favour of a ceasefire while the UK abstained. Following on from that, the UN opened up a special session of the General Assembly in which all member states were eligible to vote. In total, 153 countries voted for a ceasefire. Only 10 nations, including the US, voted against, while 23 countries, including both the UK and Germany, abstained. For many of us, the images of death, particularly of young children, continue to flood our social media timelines, and it seems like the end is still a long way out of sight. At this point, I wanted to ask American-Palestinian artist Saj Issa about the changes that she's experienced visiting Palestine over her lifetime and what it was like as an artist speaking out on the subject. How are you today? I'm doing okay. 
usually the, the the way I feel in the morning is based off the last image that I saw before I went to bed. If people aren't setting boundaries in terms of what they're consuming and how they're consuming it, then it'll really affect their mood. And so I'm feeling okay today. There's something weird about this world that we live in. And it's kind of like, I guess it would have been more normal 200 years ago the way that just really graphic forms of violence has just become so normalized into our daily intake of imagery it's it 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 can be quite intense you know and i think you you do have to understand that you know this has a really toxic relationship with your mental health and things like that i do want to i do want to touch off what you just had said like this like the kind of normalization that happens and war and that's not something that a lot of people who is peoples are victims of this or are comfortable speaking about but because i have always been interested in the evolution of how progressive humans are you know uh, i think that a book that really does a great job at speaking about the progressiveness of humanity is um what is it the better angels of our nature by Steven Pinker, and also 21st Lessons of the 21st Century by Yuval Harari. I think those two books does do a great job at talking about the evolution of war. Um, so I've been kind of thinking about that and reflecting on that as I've been like witnessing the atrocities that are happening and comparing today's atrocities to war 300, 500 years ago. While there are less, significantly less people dying today, I don't think that's quite a good measure to judge whether or not we're, you know, becoming more human. So my name is Saj Issa. I'm a Palestinian American artist living in America right now. Both my parents were born in Palestine. Uh, my grandparents were born in Palestine. Their grandparents, and so were their grandparents. And um, I'm first generation American. How have you seen that situation change in your lifetime? I recall seeing like the beginning of the establishment of the apartheid wall and also like checkpoints when these structures became opted for a more permanent structure like a cement wall or cement grounds in the checkpoint uh, area. Just like having these like permanent structures, that's when it became more real because if you know you're walking through a checkpoint which is or an a place where palestinians who want to leave towards you know occupy palestinian territories slash israel territories have to physically go through a gated system to like have their passports or show identification to be allowed entry the evolution of the occupation through those structures how does your experience differ from as an American Palestinian to Palestinian Palestinian? Like I said, I'm an American citizen, so I have the luxury of, you know, traveling in both territories. And that being said, I have an understanding of what a society, a coexistent society and a very diverse society can look like, having experience, you know, witnessing that in America. I'm allowed to, again, travel in both territories, but Someone like my, you know, grandfather or late grandparents who uh, were born before the state of Israel cannot travel freely outside of the West Bank territories. You know, even like my cousins and family members there that are Palestinian citizens, you know, it just feels so beyond privileged, you know, to I don't even want to say the word privilege. It just makes me feel really guilty to be able to like drop in when I want to and it's like oh I'm gonna go see these historic you know biblical religious sites and that's a luxury to have that freedom to do so over you know my family members that permanently live there. I want to start with October the 7th when those attacks started happening. Do you remember finding out about what was happening there and do you remember what you were feeling at that time? I had my girlfriends over, we were hanging out that night, we stayed up late and we just like were scrolling through Instagram. And so it's like 
you know, past midnight and American time zone and then early morning and that region's time zone. And we're like, oh my God, what, what, what is this? And so we're freaking out. And so I was just so tired. I was like, I think that this is one of those other things that's just going to kind of like blow over. But by the time I woke up, it got significantly more intense. And so I was just like, wow, this is, this is the start of a war. Did you at any point feel scared? Yeah, definitely. I think that people immediately fled to taking a stance on social media and that kind of became a little uncomfortable to continuously seeing over and over and over again without these people having context of anything that has been going on for the past 75 years. My feelings were a reflection of, you know, just what other people were thinking. It definitely felt like a post 9-11, a post 9-11 moment in America, not just over there, you know, especially in America. You know, on the first week of the conflict, many ignorant people fled to taking a stance on social media. And so, like I said, they completely disregarded everything that was happening um, in terms of the occupation, apartheid, and ethnic cleansing of Palestinian people. So uh, a lot of their response felt like selective outrage, and that feels really hurtful. You talk about this being reflective or reminiscent of your experience post 9-11. What was that like for you as a young Muslim girl, I actually don't know if you're Muslim. Yeah, yeah, that. Muslim identifying. Young girl in the Midwest at this point. Tell me a little bit about that. Yeah, definitely. I mean, as a stranger walking around in public, no one can really identify me as being Arab or Muslim. You know, I don't wear the hijab. I'm racially ambiguous, so I'm privileged in that sense. I mean, so most people think that I'm Italian or Mexican. So given my involvement in expressing my heritage very freely and publicly, I do feel the consequences of being targeted considering the history of many activists before me had faced. My mother, who is visibly Muslim, she tells me she feels extremely unsafe today, especially with all the Islamophobic hate crimes happening in America. And, you know, I recall after 9-11, people at the grocery store would call her a terrorist and shout out racial slurs. Although I'm not around her as an adult, like I don't, you know, govern her. But I was like as a kid, just like watching out and very skeptical and very um, observant of all of those interactions that she would have. And kind of go right over her head. Like she just kind of really ignored it. But I think that because she is exposed to all of the crimes that are happening today, she's more aware of it. She does tell me, you know, like the way that people like stare her down at the grocery store or whatever. Since the attacks on the 7th of October, cases of reported Islamophobia and anti-Semitism have reached unprecedented levels. At the end of November, three Palestinian students aged 20 were shot in Vermont. Tonight, a manhunt underway for the suspect who police say shot and injured three Palestinian U.S. college students who were visiting family in Burlington, Vermont for Thanksgiving. Despite this, protests throughout the West continue to grow in support demanding for peaceful resolutions. Behind me, you see the thousands upon thousands of people who have come to Washington, D.C. for the March on Washington for Palestine. People around the country are here to demand an end to Israel's genocidal bombing of Gaza, here to demand an end to the 75-year Israeli occupation of Palestine. I feel like the difference between the U.K. and the U.S. is it's usually really subtle, but in this regard, it feels really strong. And I feel like this is the first time that I've ever seen there be such a vocal movement towards the Palestinian cause. Yeah, definitely. No, I definitely agree with you. Like of all moments in history, this has been the most like support and uh, just so much bravery that I've seen from so many people being very you know, taking a stance. And I think that a lot of that had to do with one, civil rights movements, you know, gave a lot of context to marginalization and lack of freedom for certain people in America, but also the BLM movement in 2020, which did a lot of kind of like, which laid down a lot of groundwork for education of what happens to people of color communities and the negligence and oppressive systems that are in place. So I think that because the 2020 movements have 
really educated a lot of people that kind of made people feel more confident to be more vocal about the Palestinian cause. And the way that I see it split, I think that because majority of my world and my community is the art world, it feels like there was never a time of such intense censorship in the art world uh, as much as there is now. It just feels so, so absurd that the discipline that champions itself as being inclusive and the avenue for freedom of speech has been the thing that's been suppressing that and really trying to censor artists from speaking. What has your experience as an artist vocalizing your position? What has that been like for you? Actually, let me go back as an artist vocalizing your position on this matter. Has it changed from pre-October the 7th to just now? Yeah, definitely. Oh, definitely has changed. So for a while now, I've, I felt like I had to be really quiet of how much of my identity I could share, um, especially in art spaces, ironically. Um, I faced many backlashes and criticism in the, in the past and lost relationships with galleries because they didn't want me to reveal or share too much about my stories. They'd see things like I'm being too political you know, they're interested in like the art, but they're like, don't speak about it. You know, I can't help but that I was born into a political identity. Like I said, wouldn't it make sense that the discipline that champions itself for being inclusive to all voices and freedom of speech be the place to express those controversies? You know, it feels really daunting that even the most successful artists of our time are now being censored for taking a stance about Palestine. For me, as of late, I definitely took the liberty to just be like, you know, screw it this is my people, if this is the community and discipline that is not going to respect my voice, um, just uh, j my identity alone, um, I don't think that I want to be a part of it in the way that they have facilitated it for uh, so many years now. Why do you think you were being encouraged not to speak about this kind of stuff? Because... Um, Many collectors in the art world, specifically the American market, are uh, Zionist or pro pro Israeli Zionists, and um, the gallerists were afraid to, you know, offend those collectors. And so these would be people that would be really interested about my work. They might have read something about my bio that just turned them off, and they're like okay, well, you know, she is Palestinian, but let's look through her social media. Let's dig through and see what her stances are. And, you know, I don't know what Palestinian there is out there that is going to be against the liberation of their people or speak about that. And so once they would see certain drops about me expressing my, my view, that happens to be simultaneously political, right? We're like, you know, she posted this a while ago, I don't think that I want to like buy this because it conflicts with my views. And so I'd get a call from a gallerist and be like, hey, can you take that down? That would be the gentle way to put it, actually. I would get a call saying, yeah, so I'm curious to, 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 to hear about what your political stance is. And I think that it is wrong and blah, blah, blah. I'm like, wait, are you trying to really educate me about the liberation of my people and how that is offensive to your collectors? Or are you just asking me to take that post down? Because... Uh, the latter would actually be more respectful for you to do. So how has it been more recently talking about this stuff? How how has that response been? I mean, people that are follow your page, they opt in, right? For a while now, I was pretty ambiguous about, you know, just like it wasn't a thing that you could automatically find if you went to my profile. Like I don't, I don't uh, consider or identify myself with the Palestinian flag. I did have a couple opportunities, you know, get lost. And the, the wording of that wasn't because that I'm Palestinian. It was just like, but I, I spoke on it, on it on their behalf. I was like, yeah, too hot to show a Palestinian artist right now, huh? They're like, okay, we'll just like table this for another time when it's not so hot too. How did you feel the art world responded or reacted to or has responded or reacted to this situation? Many people who work in the art world, curators, writers, 
um, people that are really fostering the cultural enrichment of the art world have their hands tied uh, behind their backs because the art world is, um, you know, very distinguished between the people that are creating the culture and then the people that are funding the culture. And so those are people with two completely different political views. I don't know. I hope that there's more conversations happening that are not online to talk about ways that what what does an art world look like without the suppression of censorship? I think that people are doing the best that they can right now. And um, unfortunately, we're going to have to reconsider the way that museums and institutions are funded because those funders are the ones who are very much so threatening museums and curators and the people on the board. Can you give me some examples of this? I cannot. I'm sorry. I can't give names. I can't. <laughs> it's just... <laughs> Wait, the thing is, right, the thing is, if we look at this, and I, I understand what you're saying, but if I put that out as it is, without a kind of an example, it leans into a trope. Okay. So the title of this book is called Culture Strike, Art and Museums in an Age of Protest. This book is written by Laura Rakovich, who is the former director of the Queens Museum in New York, and she examines the flashpoints and provides historical context for today's controversies. And so she talks about her experience and having to resign after three years at working at the museum um, due to this particular, but other instances, but this particular instance of the museum who, Queens Museum, had for some time now, they particularly refrain from engaging or hosting political um, events, had then wanted to host a annual um, celebration for the state of Israel. And so um, she went ahead and argued that and because she did, there was a lot of pushback and it was a very controversial um, experience for her to, to have to deal with. That's a, that's a hard ask to ask artists to just shut up and paint, right? Like, isn't this what we go into this field for as to, you know, express like, yeah, you could be an abstract non-representational artist, but a lot of those emotions are really put into the canvas. It's a lot of those experiences that we feel and many artists today who are artists of color come from those marginalized backgrounds and traumatic histories. And so all of that all of that breath goes into the work. And so it's just really hypocritical to ask those artists to refrain from speaking about the issue because they don't have enough education or, you know, they're, they're, they don't have enough experience on it. I think that's wrong. In the book Saj was referring to, Culture Strike, Art and Museums in the Age of Protest, two big examples that are referenced are the influence of money from organisations such as the Sackler family and tear gas manufacturer Warren Canders. Once you start to follow the money and pull back the curtain on large parts of the institutional art world, it can become a pretty dark place. The US Supreme Court heard arguments today in one of the most important corporate bankruptcy cases in decades. It involves the players at the centre of the opioid epidemic, Purdue Pharma and the Sackler family who owned the company. The court is weighing whether to approve Purdue Pharma's controversial bankruptcy deal that would give billions of dollars to victims of the opioid epidemic while protecting members of the Sackler family from current and future opioid-related civil lawsuits. In 2022, Purdue Pharma, the big pharma giants that were ran by the Sackler family, ended up having to pay $6 billion in cash for the role Oxycontin, the drug they were manufacturing, was playing in the opioid crisis. The Sackler family happened to be one of the biggest donors for the Met Museum. Questions were also asked around the former board member of the Whitney Museum, Warren Canders, and the conflict in his role as a board member of a museum whilst being one of the leading manufacturers of the tear gas that was being used in protests across the US. Fuck your tear gas! Fuck your tear gas! Fuck your tear gas! FTP! Fuck the police! I'm interested in what does and doesn't constitute valid criticism around these matters. For example, longtime photographer and activist Nan Golding this year topped the art newspaper's power list of influential artists for her work on AIDS activism and tireless efforts at exposing the Sacklers. But at the same time, world-renowned artist Ai Weiwei has just had a show pulled at the Listen Gallery in London over a tweet. 
He wrote, the sense of guilt around the persecution of Jewish people has been, at times, transferred to offset the Arab world. Financially, culturally, and in terms of media influence, the Jewish community has had a significant presence in the US. The annual $3 billion aid package to Israel has for decades been touted as one of the most valuable investments the US has ever made. This partnership is often described as one of shared destiny. To help me understand this boundary a little bit better, I wanted to speak with London-based author and lecturer Raphael Schachter. Why do you think there's many cases of people being accused of misrepresentation of Jews, anti-Semitism, or to a degree being silenced over this in a way that didn't exist with the solidarity that was expressed through Black Lives Matter? It's a good question. I think it's the other way around. Did like museums and institutions in the art world so readily take it up superficially? Some superficially. I think almost entirely superficially. My 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 feeling within the within the museum world in any case. If you take the Ai Weiwei comment, that wasn't actually about Israel, it was about Jews. The issue there is not, oh, Ai Weiwei is showing solidarity to Palestinians. He was saying, oh, well, Jews like are the most powerful people in the world and they control the media. So, I mean, that that's not about Israel and Palestine. I think one of the issues is the way critiques of Israel. I could not be more supportive of critiques of the state of Israel. The political... You know, like Bolsonaro, you know, like Argentina's new president, like, you know, Trump, Israel is being run by the most horrific fascist political, most horrific fascist politicians. I think one of the issues is when it falls into talking about all Israelis being like this, all Zionists being like that, and very quickly falling into all Jews likewise being like X. So I think the tropes that people often fall into, um, or the kind of the, the positions that people often fall into, fall into classic anti-Semitic tropes. They're so tightly woven together that I think people often just fall into them, maybe without consciously doing so. I don't think that every person that makes a comment, which I think is, is anti-Semitic, is anti-Semitic themselves, but I think the comment may be. The Ai Weiwei thing is confusing, but talking about Jews running the world when there's like 15 million Jews that make up like 0.05% of the global population is firstly, like, I just think, like, not true. And I think, I think you know, statistics, well, facts bear that out, even if there is a disproportionate kind of position considering their number but likewise it's just one of the most basic tropes around jews that has been around forever that whether it's like communism or capitalism we are the people behind everything pulling the strings like the puppet master this is one of like the classic tropes around jews that has been used forever so when you're falling into it whilst talking about israel i i'm not here to like police what people talk about but I can tell you that when Ai Weiwei talks about Jews running the media and the, you know Jews having control of all the media, that instantly makes me feel uncomfortable. Is there any truth in the claim that Jews have significant power or control within the art world? I mean, I just came back from a meeting yesterday where we were planning who was going to win the next Turner Prize. Yeah, and it was a group of like exclusively there was rabbis and uh it was a but no i'm just joking i certainly don't run uh the art world my dad was a barber and uh, my mum was a tourist guide um and i didn't grow up with anyone who was running the art world so there may be there may be like individuals in the art world who are jewish and successful but i, I don't know i don't even know what that means Winding back, I would also say that I think it's very important that I would never release a Palestinian person language around this at all. Like, I would never, ever do that. Um, and that's also not something that, within within the context of, like, rising anti-Semitism that has emerged 
uh, you know that has re-emerged once again it's not never really goes away but it kind of it, it, it's enabled to come back out again and um, that's happening in the moment i am certainly not worried about palestinians at all i'm worried about white people both on the right and on the left I think trying to say that, you know, oh, no one can talk about the fact that, you know, sack, the Sacklers uh, are Jewish. Trying to, do, you know, to stop people talking about that, of course, would be would be wrong. But starting to kind of allude to all kind of shadowy tropes of people that, like, are like the puppet masters behind whatever world, it's just, like, we've just read this before and we've seen where it ends up. And and the thing is, I, I feel really, really strongly about this. Like, I, I have students who feel silenced by the current situation you know i am very conscious of like how you know there is this this, you know, this this is a real feeling that people have i personally don't think it's that difficult i mean maybe because my radar for anti-semitism is so strong and it really is you know my ears are like really ready to hear any little subtle nuanced racist remark so maybe because of that, I, I don't think it's a problem talking about this. I think the whole like, oh, you know, anti-Zionism isn't anti-Semitism. It's not complicated. That argument is not complicated. Of course, I, I prefer like anti-Israel rather than anti-Zionism because I think what people are talking about when they talk about Zionism are, are many different things. But being against the actions of the state of Israel, the idea that would make you anti-Semitic is crazy. There are often occasions where it's instrumentalized to be in that way. So people will just accuse people of anti-Semitism when there is no anti-Semitism there. That does happen. I want people to be able to to speak their minds, but doing that, you just have to be super careful about just not dehumanizing people, whether it's Palestinians or whether it's Jews. We've used this, you've used this word a lot, and I think it would be really good to have a clear definition of what it is that you mean when you use it what is zionism okay so uh this is a question that i talk about a lot there are many different perspectives on on what it means for me zionism means something like very simple which just it just means self-determination for jewish people that's all it means zionism doesn't mean that you support the actions of the state of israel that you don't, that it doesn't mean that you believe that, you know, nothing the state of, that anything the state of Israel do is fine. It just means that you believe that Jewish people should, should have self-determination. When people use Zionist as like, you know, a pejorative, oh, he's just a Zionist. You know, they're just Zionists. I understand them, what, what they're mostly saying when they're calling someone a Zionist, they're saying someone who supports the actions of the state of Israel as a political entity and that is totally fine with subjugating and murdering Palestinian babies. I'm deeply uncomfortable about that because, uh, one, because I just think it's you know ridiculous. Two, because you know 85% of the global Jewish community are Zionists. And that certainly doesn't mean that they support what Israel is doing. Like, of course they don't. Like, my, my parents are both classic Zionists. Right, you know, they don't live in Israel. They're both from London. They both grew up here, but they both believe, you know, in the the fact that Jewish people should have, you know, self determination. And why do they believe that? Because whenever they haven't had self determination, they've been murdered. Right, that's just a fact. Right, does that mean that they support it at all costs in terms of you know the annihilation of Palestinians and the ongoing situation? Of course it doesn't. Of course it doesn't. So that's why I find it very difficult when people just use it in this like pejorative sense without like really understanding what people mean by it. What does it mean to be a Zionist? And of course, right now, like with the settlers, there is like a, there is a, a Zionism which is like it is a total fascism. I would argue the vast majority of population, Jewish population won't have nothing to do with it. But what I don't believe is that what the state of Israel has become is the which is you know a violent oppressive currently you know fascist regime in my opinion 
I don't believe that still that that means you know Zionism is totally over and just you know we need to destroy the state of Israel. Firstly, because like, well, you know, what happens next? I still don't believe that Jewish people will ever really be safe. Now, whether we just have to like just live with that and that's it. But so I totally understand why there is a desire to have self determination. Like I, I just get it. And I think it's kind of hubristic not to understand that. That doesn't mean that I agree with it. Oh, I, I, I don't. It's, it's like one, one of the things I always say is that, um, yeah. one, one of the things I say is that um, it's like it, my Zionism is similar. But it, I, I find it is very similar to um, current kind of proponents of communism, right? Who they always say, oh, well, actually, you know, that wasn't communism. What we're planning on is is communism. That wasn't communism, which is what every communist now said, right? You know, Cuba wasn't communism. Soviet Union wasn't communism. China wasn't communism. You know, North Korea wasn't communism. You know, the real communism is coming. And I feel like my Zionism kind of often falls into that space because obviously if you see what's happened uh, since 48, you know, the Zionist project, you know, hasn't really got to a great place. But at its essence, that idea of self-determination, it's 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 hard to disagree with when people, you know, were based on the reality of what people have been through, it's hard, and what the Jewish people have been through, it's hard to disagree with it. For me, it's, it's hard to find a rational argument to disagree with it. it and that means, again, I'm talking conceptually. I'm not talking about post-48, but it's good. I'm talking about Zionism conceptually. For you as a member of the diaspora, then, why should identifying Jews have or need a state? Yeah, so I think the, the kind of idea of why Jewish people need a state, I think, is almost kind of the reverse way around. Like, I think it would be much, much better if Jews didn't need a state or if Jews didn't feel like they needed a state. And before the Second World War, you know, there was a real, you know, Zionism as a political project was a competing project amongst other political movements. Sadly, you know, Herzl, you could argue that he was basically proven right in his idea of what the Zionist project was about. And I don't mean that in reference to the Nakba. I don't mean that in reference to anything that's happened after 48. I mean it totally in reference of his argument that Jews would never be safe. They would never be safe in Europe. And I, when I say that, I don't mean he was proven right for anything that's happened after 1948, for the Nakba, for all the wars, for, you know, for the horrific um, reality of the occupation. What I mean is that he saw in the late 1890s that Jews would not be safe in Europe, that in the heart of the most quote-unquote enlightened, liberal, democratic parts of the world, supposedly, that their Jews still would not be safe. So, unfortunately, we've had, you know, a millennia of oppression and of constant, you know, of, of of never a moment in which Jewish safety was secured. And that's why people want to have a Jewish state, because they want self-determination and they want safety. The saddest part of that story is that that's not what's happening in Israel now. That's the most, you know, depressing. What, well, there are so many depressing things. But that's one of you know the depressing things is that that idea of you know Israel Israel is not doing that. Why historically do you believe that Jews have been persecuted or or faced oppression? Yeah, so I mean Jews are the ultimate other. They're the ultimate you know outsider. They are the very concept of of otherness. Yeah, you, know, you could argue is based around the idea of the Jew, the Jew, the wandering Jew, the Jew without a state the Jew is here but is not from here you can take it back from you know when Jews were first pushed out of of the UK from York you can take it back to so many incidents of persecution 
And you can also take it back to the very basic fact of, you know, I, no, I'm, I'm not, I'm, I'm not answering this question. I want to answer it. Sorry, 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 sorry. It's too complex of a question for me to answer. Are Israelites? Yeah. Are, are they not just the same as uh, European white colonizers? So um, the first thing I would say is that there is something very simple about the situation in Israel Palestine, and yet there are things which are very complex. So, you know, people try and say, oh, it's too complex to talk about. People try and say, oh, no, it's just really simple to talk about. I think it's both. The simple thing is that, you know, Palestine and Palestinians have been subjugated and are facing the most intense and unbelievable oppression. And that there is, you know, we are, you know, there is, it's not simple to see what, you know, who, where our solidarity needs to be. Well, of course, we don't simply like it's not just an on or off. It's not like you know we've got we can have more solidarity. It's like love, right? Love is not something which has like a maximum and you have to share it. There is a maximum potential for it, like there is solidarity. So there's a simple thing and there's a complex thing. And a complex thing is that the founding of the state of Israel and Israel itself, whilst working through a settler colonial framework, is not the idea of settler colonialism. That we think of when we think of you know the us canada australia it's not and and equally this kind of idea of uh israel as a white country is much much more complex than that when it is actually 50 percent mizrahi and 50 percent uh jews from the middle east and north africa so um on the first hand of course the you know with the birth of israel in 48 the majority of the population at that point were survivors that had been, you know, there were stateless survivors, in fact, from all over Europe. But in the second wave uh, of migration to Israel, uh, the population was coming from Iraq, from Iran, from Yemen, from Algeria, from Morocco, from India, from all over the Middle East, North Africa. Actually, a community at that point, about 900,000 to a million, who were ethnically cleansed uh, and removed forcibly from their homes all over the Middle East and North Africa, uh, who then ended up in Israel. So actually the population on the one hand uh, is not simply a white population of Europeans, and then on the other hand is a population of refugees. So that doesn't trump what happened after 48. That doesn't mean that it's okay what happened, but it's a fact. And it's a fact which does often disappear uh, in the language used around what's happening uh, in Israel. So the language falls into this kind of concept of decolon decolonialism um, that relies on ideas we know of through North America and through Australasia, which are simply different in this context. It doesn't mean it make it okay, it just makes it different. It relies on concepts of apartheid, which, whilst are happening in Israel, the occupied territories function through a system of legal apartheid, doesn't mean that apartheid functions through race. It doesn't function through race. So the, the, the complex thing is, is trying to frame these issues without simply falling into kind of falsehoods which deny kind of the fact of Jews of color, that the, deny the fact of Jews, the majority of Jews in Israel not being white. That doesn't make anything okay, it's just a fact. What does modern anti-Semitism look like to you? And how big of a re threat is it? Okay, so, um, oh God, this is tough. This is this has been a tough interview, I've got to say. This has been tough. It's exhausting as a Jew to have to explain to people that anti-Semitism exists. In the same way, it is just exhausting for people of colour to have to explain that racism exists. It's it's beholden on people, if they care, to do their own research about it, rather than to, you know, take the person subject to the racism and force them to explain to you and force them to kind of enact that labour in order to do so, in a general sense, right? Likewise, you know, anti-Semitism is, you know, is really back in the game. Not that they ever went away, but anti-Semitism is like, you know, rife murders and, you know, mass murders in the US to 
terrorist attacks and murders in France to just the level of anti-Semitic crime in the UK. It, it, it's not it's, it's not gone away. It's a totally and it's always existed. And the idea that it's just going to kind of disappear is hubristic. That's something I've really kind of realized. Whilst I thought there was this kind of like arc of history, you know, we're just in this loop. And the Jew is the epitome of evil in Western culture. You know, from the murdering of Christ, right? The Jew is always the ultimate outside and the ultimate other. So the Shoah, like the Holocaust, is not going to change. The fact there's anti-Semitism, often anti-Semitism emerges because people feel this kind of like guilt around it, and so they get pissed off and angry about it. Likewise, you know, the idea of like, oh, you know, you're fine, you know, you've got job, you know, you're in, a, you know, you're in politics, you know, you're successful. Jews in Germany in the 1920s were the most successful, the most integrated, the most established community in the world. It can happen anywhere. It can happen at any time, and it does. The victim complex, like that all Jews have, like is epigenetic, right? The trauma that they carry is like in your body. Yeah, you know, the reason like that many of us have survived is because one of our, you know, great grandparents were like, vibes off, let's get on a boat. That is the only reason why I'm here today. What role do you think art plays in times like this? I think that art is a kind of space and a medium that allows to ask questions, questions that have no answers. It's a place for processing. It's a place that can hold complexity. It's a place that can foster empathy, which I think is kind of uh, lacking at the foundation of all the discourse, uh, especially when things are so heated and so emotional. And I think that empathy kind of functions as both a foundation and and the gateway for broader and more uh, direct, I guess, action uh, within this reality. It, it's a way to understand the reality and understand this kind of like geopolitical landscape, uh, but also the human beings that that live within it. And I think that it that it can be kind of some sort of uh, almost like emotional compass, and then be used to understand again how to act in a more direct way. It's also kind of a means to realize that all these issues touch us all and that one cannot be fully separated from them. For me, that was a big realization while dealing with certain subject matter, uh, like, you know, walls and borders and fences and stuff like that, but more on this metaphorical level, uh, while kind of thinking about the, the local reality here, it took me a while to understand that, that I am part of this reality uh, not in a metaphorical sense, but in a very uh, real and actual sense. And I think that kind of created a shift and helped me understand the responsibility that I have also as the Israeli in this uh, power dynamic, this local power dynamic between uh, the occupier and the occupied. Yeah, and I think that it, it helped me understand my responsibility connecting these two realms, which are like the creative and the emotional and the like more activist related or kind of solidarity based. How, if at all, has this impacted your sense of identity? I don't, I don't know if it's changed anything in terms of the kind of like you know my ideological uh, foundation or or the way that I view kind of like the moral predicament of this reality. You know, I, I know that the events of October seven for me and I know many others kind of shattered this illusion uh, of you know Israel being this like impenetrable force, and I think that that really touches on many many different layers of our identity, both personal and collective. But it's also kind of showed how, you know, these years of, of siege and uh, the reality that the occupation and apartheid created, you know, it's a situation that can't be managed. So, you know, for many years, Netanyahu has kind of like been, his kind of catchphrase was that we have, we must manage the conflict. And I think that's kind of proven that it's, it's impossible. And now that we're in the midst of this like very grave humanitarian crisis, the wounds are getting deeper and deeper and we're reaching a place that it'll be harder and harder to come back from. The trauma is deeper. It's kind of like being absorbed in the land. I always think of it as like, you know, that all these things get absorbed in the soil and 
it's kind of always a question what what can ever grow from this soil can there ever be anything that isn't like poisoned can it be like a prosperous growth from the soil and it's kind of showed that like the fates of of everyone are are kind of intertwined and there's this kind of like shared destiny it's more urgent now than ever to to create kind of a uh at, at least start thinking about the first steps towards kind of a future where where uh everyone can uh uh live safely and and freely because until everyone is able to do those things and uh you know we'll we'll all be haunted by this kind of like moral stain and it all it won't leave us so i say you're waving a big magic wand and you have the ability to do this what would your first steps towards peace look like I think that the first and most immediate step is stating a, pr- a permanent ceasefire and the return of, of hostages. You know, I, I think we're kind of at a state where tragically on both the Palestinian and uh, Israeli side realizing uh, that there is no military solution to the situation that we're in. Uh, there has to be some sort of political agreement and political thinking. The first steps to that uh, diplomatic talks there's been any kind of like quote unquote win for the Israeli state it was only when the hostages were returned because of uh diplomacy i think that at the base of kind of like the the broader picture vision there has to be some some sense of acknowledgement of the reality that we're in acknowledgement of the the trauma that is inflicted on people and that people are experiencing i think that that really goes a long way in in as, as a first step I think that that's something that is lacking and I think that it's something that's important for the Palestinian struggle and the Palestinian people there there's a large uh, sense of you know like a, a lack of acknowledgement of their uh, of their history and I think that now also you know Israeli society is feeling uh, something very similar October 7th touched on these like very deep and inherent uh, generational traumas I think so much has changed in the past two and a half months, like the, the scale and, and the amount of, you know, not to get into numbers, but like the amount of uh, death and destruction that has happened on the Gazan side is unreal. I think that when two people experience such a deep level of trauma, uh, it might be a bit, sound a bit naive, but I think that it's also kind of an, uh, like under very tragic circumstances an opportunity to, yeah, if, if there's anything that that ushers the, the need to talk and the need to understand one another it's you know this this is the time so i think there are, there are two steps there's kind of like the immediate step and then the broader which requires kind of like a more uh wild and and creative and empathetic kind of uh political imagination things that we're all in abundance of at the moment <laughs> from our leaders <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> In hopes of the overdue ceasefire actually becoming a reality, it's important to start picturing how exactly long-term peace and prosperity might look for the region. It's long been argued in the West that a permanent two-state solution is the answer, in which both Israel and Palestine have self-determination and autonomy. But as with everything to do with the area, nobody can seem to come close to agreeing on what even those borders or boundaries might look like. I wanted to get Saj's thoughts on the matter. What does a free Palestine look like to you? Oh, yes. I'm so happy you asked me that question. <laughs> Throughout the process of all of this, I think that a lot of people are forgetting to you know, exercise the muscle of imagining. This conflict has been going on long before my parents' time. Never in all of apartheid history has there been more global sympathy and solidarity for the Palestinian people. And this is what revolution looks like. It's going to be painful, grotesque, and overwhelming. And um, because I have the liberty and have more freedom to speak about this subject here in America than I would in anywhere else, Palestine and Israel, I feel a deep sense of responsibility to educate other people on this struggle. And really just imagining what shaping a free Palestine looks like, like that's a huge honor for us too on this position and this day and age to really create what a free Palestine looks like. And for me, that looks like coexistence between Arabs, Jews, Muslims, 
Christians, Baha'is, who are also neglected from being part of this group of, of liberated people. It looks like having Palestinians have the right to return to their homeland. It looks like Palestinian people having the same equal rights as Israeli people. And for me, I want a one-state solution. I think that that is the only way out, is a one-state solution. I don't think that a two-state solution is practical. I think that this enragement would go on, pick up <laughs> in another time in history. We need to use history as a way to be a tool to educate us on how we can do better. And, you know, the closest thing to, to use as an example is the South African apartheid. And so it wasn't until that the apartheid fell um, that people naturally assimilated to society. You know, it's not to say that racism vanishes all at once, but it takes time for people to assimilate. That's what a free Palestine looks like to me. Do you think you want a one state solution because you're American? And you've seen how a one large, you know, multicultural state can function? Yeah, I mean, like this past summer, hanging out with Palestinians and college students that live and were born and live there. And I talked to them about it. You know, they don't, they weren't really exposed to as much as that I have, especially in like the occupied territories. But even they imagine what kind of freedom they would have. Like they dream of the day that they can go to the Mediterranean Sea. And the only chance of that ever happening is if there is a one state solution. And I think that they, they're very much so deserving of that. I think that there's going to be a lot of people that are rejectful of that. But as time goes on, we have to think about the futures to come. They're not going to know what apartheid is. And so that's, that's the generation we have to be thinking about is what's, what's, coming after us, not what we want and what my grandparents want and what has worked for them. It's like, no, we have to think about what's to come next. And we want a whole new generation of people to assimilate to a land, visually seeing different cultures, religions, and uh, complexions of people. Does Israel exist in this world? You know, you can call it Satan's asshole for all I care. <laughs> and so again, I don't care what the land is called. I really don't. I don't care if it's called Israel or Palestine. I think that it would have to adopt a whole new name for people to be content with. And I just think it's like, why not the Holy Land? Like, <laughs> I know that's that's completely opposite of Satan's asshole. But I mean, even calling it the Holy Land uh, with no governing religious state, with no ruling religious system is very important that is very that, like number one particular to what a free uh holy land looks like is that there it's a democracy there is no one ruling uh religious system in place in order to get a step towards that peace would require intervention from uh several qualified female uh representatives i think that if we learn anything in this time, this is what happens when egotistical men leaders in, in charge. <laughs> who can who can one up each other every week? What do you think the first step towards this free pa free Palestinian utopia, this in your words, one state solution? What do you think the first step to to that might look like? And I'm trying to find a bit of hope in this. It requires listening to each other's stories, starting with the oppressed and forcing corrupt leaders to resign and having to face the consequences of their evil actions under international law. It would also require qualified individuals to intervene who are specifically not men and create a complete new system that is fair, as fair as possible. And governing systems have to take accountability for their unfathomable damages that they've caused and pay reparations. And so I think all of that simultaneously is the first step towards peace. What do you have to lose by giving something else a try? Thank you to Adam Yakutieli, Sajisa, and Raphael Schachter for being generous with their time and their energy to talk with me about this. I promise that that door is fully open to revisit this topic once again. 
Unfortunately, I find it hard to believe that we'll be seeing peaceful resolutions anytime in the immediate future. When moments like this come, it's important that every single one of us does our best to stand up for what we believe in, to listen to as many different voices as we can, to educate ourselves to the best of our ability, and most importantly, that we don't stop calling out injustice when we see it. We'll be back with you in the new year. Till then, take care of yourselves and each other.